Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. Amen. Happy Father's Day. Powerful video. Our team here produced that, put that together as a tribute to our dads here. Uh, incredible job. And dads, we pray that you are blessed today with your family. And uh, we are in the book of Ephesians. So if you're visiting today with your dad, just so you know, we've been studying the book of Ephesians since March. Can you believe that? Since March. And next week will be our last message in Ephesians, if the Lord wills it to happen that way. And uh, so open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. I want to thank God for that word we received today through the body of Christ, the gift of a word. Uh, that was confirmation from the nine o'clock service. And our brother in Christ who gave that encouraging word today was not in the first service. And yet that was the same thing we heard in the nine o'clock. God has more for us. We must make room in our lives, our hearts. One of the places we can start is in our own personal time with God. Allow him to speak to you through the word, through the Bible. Allow him to speak to you through prayer. Uh, serving him, cleaning out house out of our hearts and minds and letting God come and fill. And listen, church, we cannot be a status quo Christian, a nominal Christian in this world that we're living in today. We're either all in or we're not in enough. We're either all in or we're not. We're not ready for what's coming and what is already around us. It's too late. The avalanche is here. The world is ex exponentially getting more and more wicked. Let's not join them because they need Jesus too. And we need to help them out of this world. Amen. Amen. And we're in a battle. And that is so fitting for today that you cannot be a status quo Christian and be in spiritual warfare. The devil will pick you apart. He is an expert um, fighter. That's all he knows how to do. That's what he's been doing with God, opposing God the entire time since uh, his existence. And here on earth, his dominion here, he's constantly trying to oppose God's work. And so we're going to read Ephesians 6, 10 through 17, so that we can be a church that's ready for the fight. So here we are, verse 10. A final word, this is Paul telling the church, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor <clears throat> so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, because of that, in other words, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness for shoes, Put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. God has saved us, but he's also equipped us for the fight. There's more than just salvation. There is all of these things as you live in this world. Here's why. When you gave your life to Christ, you didn't get beamed up to heaven. You're still here. And whether we want it to be in a fight or not, we are in one. We are in the middle of a cosmic battle between good and evil. In God's side, he's trying to save mankind from what Satan did and what sin did in the garden. He's trying to save mankind and then equip us for every good work to go out and save more people. The devil's role, destroy everything. Mock God, oppose God, do everything that 
He, he does everything he can. He energizes his spiritual forces, even people, to try to stop them from believing and trusting in Jesus. We're in the middle of that, whether we want to or not. And here's why. Because first of all, God has already won the victory. He has already won. And because God has won, Satan is in the loser bracket. And he's trying to fight back and sabotage whatever he can so that people won't be winners and victors in Christ. And he doesn't like you because you've sided with God. And because you have victory in Christ, you have a target on your back. And so Paul says, because of that, put on armor. Be strong in the Lord. And this is what he says through 10 through 13. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. So our strength to fight, uh, to face and to fight the attacks of the enemy comes from God and from his armor. The Bible always advises us to rely on God's power. It never says rely on your power. Self-reliance is not a good thing in the Christian world. We cannot survive on our own power or strength. We can barely make it through a Monday morning. Do you think we should go into the world without God if we can't make it through a Monday morning? We must rely on God's power. It would be a mistake for us to try to do life without the help of God. And Paul's saying, don't do that. Be strong in the Lord's power and might, not in your own. Put on some of God's armor. Oh, to the Jodyism. Put on all, every piece of God's armor because living without a piece leaves us vulnerable. And our ability to resist the times of evil attacks from the enemy depends on whether we live in the full armor or not. And the word says not just resist, but still be standing firm after the struggle. We're still there. We might have, you know, we might be beaten, bruised, battered a little bit, but we're still standing strong in the fight. We must put on all the armor. And another th point is that Paul makes sure you understand is the, str the struggle is not overtly with humans. In other words, it may look like you're struggling with humans, with flesh and blood, but you're actually struggling with the devil and all the evil forces in, on earth and in the heavenly realms. That's how bad they lost. That the heavens had the have the evil heavenly forces had to fight you. That's how powerful we are, only though in God under his armor. By yourself, you will be destroyed. But with God, you will be standing firm. Now here's the thing: in Ephesians 2 2, we learned that the devil does energize or influence people to do evil. Those who are controlled by their sinful nature, those who have darkened minds, the devil is influencing them through a variety of things. It could be through media. It could be through what we watch, what we read. It could be just through other people. It's entertainment, any kind of things that's keeping you from trusting in Christ. Just all the different religions, all the different um, teachings out there that would distract and confuse people about Christ. He's using all of it to make people not even believe and even to the point where they will oppose what you believe and what I believe. That is the fight. It is deep and it is grueling, but we have the armor. But question, what do spiritual battles look like in everyday life. I want to use Paul's example in Ephesus because after all, he wrote this letter from living in Ephesus and he wanted to tell them some things and he experienced spiritual battles. And so if you could go to Acts chapter 19, we're going to be in verse eight and we're going to see a real example of spiritual battles and it looks like he's fighting humans, but the devil is behind all of this. Acts chapter 19, verse 8. Paul ministers in Ephesus. Then Paul went to the synagogue and preached boldly for the next three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some...
became unstubborn, rejecting his message, <clears throat> and publicly speaking against the way, the way meaning the followers of Christ. So Paul left the synagogue. This, the synagogue was a place of worship, like a church, and took the believers with him. So he had to separate himself because they were constantly interfering when he was trying to do what he was doing. Then he held daily discussions at the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for the next two years so that people throughout the province of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the word of the Lord. God gave Paul the power to perform unusual miracles. When handkerchiefs or aprons that had merely touched his skin were placed on sick people, they were healed of their diseases and evil spirits were expelled. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Did it say that, that God or that Paul gave this power to himself? No, God gave him this power to do this. Did Paul, did Paul ask for that power uh, specifically to do those things? No, God gave him the power and he just happened to have that ability. He was gifted and graced with that kind of anointing that a handkerchief would touch someone and they'd be healed. It wasn't something he conjured up. It was by the grace of God. So don't go out buying handkerchiefs and praying over them and things like that. That is up to God. A group of Jews was traveling from town to town, casting out evil spirits. They tried to, oh, see, here's, here's where the devil gets tricky. He uses, instead of authentic fire, he's using fake fire, false fire. A group of Jews was traveling from town to town, and what I mean by fire is the Holy Spirit, town to town, casting out evil spirits. They tried to use the name of the Lord Jesus in their incantation, saying, I command you in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a leading priest, were doing this. But one time when they tried it, the evil spirit replied, I know Jesus and I know Paul, but who are you? You know what that tells us? That evil spirits can know you. That evil spirits can snuggle up and get to know you personally and know exactly who you are. And that means that they may, need to, they may know, right, what is your vice, what is your struggle, so they can pick at it and fight you personally. Then the man with the evil spirit leaps on all seven of them. <laughs> I'm adding the seven because that's what it is. The seven sons overpowered them and attacked them with such violence that they fled from the house naked and battered. Now, that coupled with the fact that Paul was preaching the gospel so powerfully that it started something. In verse 17, it says, the story of what happened spread quickly. So the news all through Ephesus to Jews and Greeks alike, a solemn fear descended on the city in the name of the Lord Jesus was greatly honored. Many who became believers confessed their sinful practices a number of them who had been practicing sorcery brought their incantation books and burned them at a public bonfire. The value of the books was several million dollars. So the message about the Lord spread widely and had a powerful effect. Now, if you go and do something like that, that do you think that everything should be good? Hey, it's a revival in Ephesus. Praise Jesus, pull out the dinners, we're gonna party. There's a revival happening in this community. Bring more people in. Yes, that would happen. But guess what happens too? The spiritual warfare. Because when you interrupt what Satan's doing, he doesn't like it. When we advance the truth of the gospel in love. And we, do you think that Paul was purposely trying to mess with someone's business? No, he was doing God's business to preach the gospel. It interfered with what the devil was doing behind the scenes. And this is what was going on. You ready? We're going to go into verse 23. About that time, serious trouble developed in Ephesus concerning the way, the followers of Christ. It began with Demetrius, a silversmith who had a large business manufacturing silver shrines of the Greek goddess Artemis. Now, Artemis was this goddess of very inappropriate things that I won't say because the kid's in here. And a vulgar image. She was depicted as very vulgar. And they worshipped her for fertility. 
and other things. And there was inappropriate parties and everything that revolved around her. He made idols and he made objects that people used to worship her. He kept many craftsmen busy too. He called them together, verse 25, along with others employed in similar trades and addressed them as follows. Gentlemen, you know that our wealth comes from this business. Interesting, isn't it? Who's behind greed? Satan. But as you have seen and heard, this man, Paul, has persuaded many people that handmade gods aren't really gods at all. And he's done this not only here in Ephesus, but throughout the entire province. So Paul's pretty famous about doing these things with the help of God. Of course, I'm not just talking about the loss of public respect for our business. I'm also concerned that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will lose its influence and that Artemis, this magnificent goddess worshiped throughout the province of Asia and all around the world, will be robbed of her great prestige. When you go to do what's right, sometimes things go wrong because Satan doesn't like it. And now the fight begins. Now, Paul wanted to stay, but his teammates and those who were his partners in ministry urged him to leave because what happened next is uh, a lot of ruckus and uh, disturbance in Ephesus, and he was at danger, in danger, and so they advised him to leave, and eventually he would leave so that he could continue his mission. He wasn't a coward. He already did what he needed to do there, and God wanted him to go to Macedonia next anyway. But what we see here is it looks like that Paul is wrestling with humans and fighting against humans. But the reality is behind all of this is the works of the devil. And so I want you to see that be careful that when you are in some kind of opposition with humans or other people that you don't point the finger so much at them first. You look through it and go, what is Satan trying to do behind the scenes here? And instead, pray for God to capture their hearts, to change the situation through the gospel of peace, to, to work on your heart, to pray for the person who has been used by the devil as a pawn to cause issues in your life or wherever it may be. Do you follow me on that? So while we don't overtly wrestle with flesh and blood, the devil will use people to cause issues in your life. But look at the truth, have spiritual eyes and discernment to go, that person Jesus died for too. So pray for your enemy, as Jesus would say. Pray for them, bless your enemy. Heap burning coals over their head so it bothers them that you're doing good to them even though they're trying to be a jerk to you. Break down what the devil is trying to do. Destroy his work, fight like that. Isn't that awesome? That is not a physical weapon. That's a spiritual weapon. That's spiritual weapons. And that's spiritual armor. Spiritual battles can be in the form of authorities in towns and cities who try to prevent Christians from spreading the message. That is happening in America right now. The subtle form of persuading and distracting Christians to invest time and energy in irrelevant side issues or to get caught up by new and distorted teaching. And then there's the age old vices of money, sex and power that Satan will use to tempt you, to keep you from being on the front lines, preaching the gospel, helping your neighbor. Now some people, we will dismiss spiritual warfare altogether struggles that we go through in life as just life. And then some people go to the other spectrum and everything is demonic, everything is a spiritual battle, and that can be dangerous too. Why do I say that? Well, because sometimes we cause the struggle ourselves because the word of God says to do something and we decide not to do it. So there are times where we need to own up and take responsibility for not obeying the word of God and we brought this struggle on ourselves for not heeding the wisdom and guidance of God's word. Been there, done that. But one of the ways that the devil does fight you in the same vein of that is he tries to keep you distracted every time you go to spend time with God. Anyone pick up the phone and look at their email or text 
right before you go to read the word of God and pray and it ruins your day? Well, it's happened to me. And so the devil was working in that and I had to take responsibility for being dumb, picking up my phone before hanging out with God. So I had to take responsibility for, I knew that I shouldn't do that. I knew that I should have sacred time with God in the morning or at night, and I should have kept all distractions out of the way, and instead I gave in to the habit of looking at my email or phone, only to have something in the inbox that is causing you know, fear and bothering me because of a situation I need to deal with that week, distracting me from hearing clearly from the voice of God that morning. That's how the devil can work. He's slick. What do I do in those moments? I apologize to God. I put the phone away or the email away. I cast my burdens on the Lord and say, Lord, take care of that. I need you today before I ever address that situation. That's all I can do. Sometimes I go for a walk. I put on worship music. I read scripture. I do everything I want to do. And I stay there until God ministers to my life. So look out because we don't need to over-spiritualize, over-sensualize everything as a spiritual attack, but we also need to be aware that there are spiritual attacks in the little things and in the big things. So what does Paul suggest? Paul says, put on the full armor of God. Because you, you aren't always gonna know if it's the devil, if it's just you know, a Monday morning and your coffee isn't working. I got a flat tire on the way to work. Is it the devil or was it the guy who didn't pick up the nails after working on the house? Well, that, maybe that was the devil, you know. <laughs> you just don't know. But what you do know to do is to live clothed in the power of Jesus Christ. We are supposed to live like that. And so he says, put on the full armor of God. And what's interesting is, is Paul is actually chained to a Roman soldier and so he's using this visual right in front of him to describe how we should live spiritually. How cool is that? Paul is a brilliant teacher. And here's a picture of a, of a soldier. We don't have the sandals or the shoes that they would wear. But this may be what he's talking about, the, the long door-like shield, the, the sword, the breastplate, the helmet. Can't see the belt necessarily. But this is an idea of what he saw every day in prison as he's writing all of his prison letters to churches that he can no longer visit because he's under shackles waiting. Under, as we learned last week, the power of Rome was so strong. It was so powerful that the only thing he could do was write, and they let him write letters. And we know that Paul had to be ministering to the soldiers, right? They were trapped. God was using Paul to minister to soldiers. What does he say to wear? First, the belt, truth. The belt of truth is the truth of God's message, but it's also living truthfully or with integrity. I love what N.T. Wright says. He says the primary thing about the Christian message is that it is true. If it isn't, it's meaningless. It isn't true because it works. It works because it's true. Never give up, give up on the sheer truth of the gospel. It's like the belt which holds everything else together in place. What's interesting is the devil is the father of lies, countering the truth of God and us. And what Paul is saying here is, is don't just know the truth, but live by the truth. Put on truth. Live with integrity and honesty because the devil will lie about your life. He will lie about our faith. He will lie about this church. He will lie about your family. But what's interesting is this is connected to the breastplate of righteousness because they're in the same sentence. And this is really interesting. The breastplate of righteousness is similar to the belt of truth because this piece represents the believer's righteous standing in Christ as well as living a righteous or integrous, a life of integrity. So we are to live a righteous life, but we stand righteous. Sam was just saying it when he was talking about the closer we get to God, the more we see how uh, the sin in our lives, but that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. 
because we can cleanse our lives and sanctify our lives, separate ourselves from sin. And the entire time, we're able to do it because God loves us and has shown his mercy to us the entire time. His mercy shows us things that need to go. He'll give us words from a brother in the church to let us know, get rid of these things. I'm trying to do a work in your life. Get rid of them because he loves us. Now, our position is righteous, and so we should live a righteous life. We are justified in God's eyes. We are saved. We are forgiven. And the devil isn't just a gifted liar. He's a gifted accuser. The Bible calls him the great accuser and slanderer. He's trying to slander you and make you look bad. Use your past sin to shame you. One of the things that the devil will say is, you didn't do enough for God today. You're not loved. You didn't do enough works for God. You ever feel that way sometimes? You're like, I don't feel holy and worthy to be loved. I am not righteous. Well, guess what? You didn't even do anything to be righteous. It's not by works that we are saved, but by faith. And so I tell the devil right back, well, guess what? It wasn't by my works that I was forgiven. It was by the work of the cross and the resurrection that I am saved and forgiven and justified. <laughs> Praise God. Well, guess what? That's the truth of God's word, so you need that piece of armor on, that belt, because it holds it together when the righteousness gets attacked. I stand righteous because God has made me righteous through his blood. God sees me as holy. Yes, do I still see some imperfections in my life the closer I get to him? Yes, and he's showing that to me so I'll repent of them and turn away because he wants me to be a holy, pure bride when he comes back because he's the groom, as the Bible says, it is an analogy, and we are the bride, the church. It is all good when he shows us that. But the devil would try to say, you're not pure, you're not clean, you're not forgiven. And you go, well, guess what? The only reason why I'm righteous is because what Jesus did for me. So are you going to destroy Jesus' works? No, you're not. Jesus has won. This is the kind of stuff you got to say to yourself sometimes. You got to speak to your Holy Spirit, so to say, the Spirit of God, and, and go, Spirit, this is what you say about me, right? Well, guess what? I'm in agreement with you. I'm in agreement with your word, God. You got to talk to God and tell him, God, I agree with you. And you got to let yourself hear it too and live it. William Barclay says this, words are no defense against accusations, but a good life is. The only way to meet accusations against Christianity is to show how good a Christian can be. Now, here's what I would say. Live like Jesus and your life will prove that the accusations are a lie. Righteousness will still be standing after the fight. Let God defend you. You live a holy life, and he will defend you. And all the lies that are said about you by other people, you know, don't let that bother you. God knows your heart. The devil's trying to use people to accuse you, shame you, to make you look bad. It doesn't matter. God knows your heart. And if you've made things right, you're good. You are at peace. It's interesting, the flow here. Put on the sandals of the gospel of peace. There's two views of this. Was he talking about being ready to share the good news of Jesus, the gospel of peace? Or was he talking about standing firm at peace because you have peace with God because you've been forgiven? Well, I think it's both. Theologians and scholars that go back and forth, which one is it? It can mean both. Because if you're at peace with God and you've been saved, you are now an ambassador and a deliverer of that gospel. And the sandals had metal studs on the bottom of them, kind of like golf cleats, golf shoes. And it was an ability to, to stand firm every time the, the attack hit or when they were holding their shield up, it would keep them planted. But they could also advance forward with their shields to push into the darkness and preach the good news and love their neighbors as themselves. That's us today. So it's both. And I personally am at peace with where I stand because of what Jesus has done for me. And you can be too. So no matter what the devil tries to say, remind him. And when he, what, is it, what does everyone always say? When he reminds you of your past, you remind him of his future. You already lost, back off, I'm at peace, God loves me, 
Nothing can separate me from God's love. Faith, shield. The Greek word here for the shield is a door. And the, the shields were like a long shield, almost the size of a door. And the shield of faith is having complete trust in Christ. Like when I've been on a roller coaster and I'm grabbing onto those handlebars, <laughs> trusting them to work. Like the latch, I got two clicks. I need at least two. I don't like going on rides when you hear a clink, and that's it. I'm like, hey, can you push that a little harder, even if it hurts me? Clink. Okay, thank you. And you're holding on for your dear life. I just recently did this in Orlando, holding on to my dear life. We hold on to our faith, but the object of our faith is Christ, so we hold on to Christ. The promises of God are faithful, true. They are yes and amen. God himself is faithful. He cannot be unfaithful. That's what you're holding on to. So when the devil is shooting, now here's the thing. The scripture here says he's shooting flaming arrows at us. The shields were layered with wood, and, and underneath one layer, before the wood trim was around it, they would put leather there and they would soak the leather in water before a fight so when a flaming arrow hit the shield it consumed that flame out your faith is able to consume and put out the attacks of the devil every temptation every lie every discouragement everything but you must hold up your faith and put it in Christ and when the battle is hard all you can do sometimes is hold on to God. All you can do is be on your knees just holding on to him. All you can do is hold on to the word of what you've learned and read all those years and the new scripture you're reading that day. When the battle gets heavy and now he's getting tricky and he's shooting things from far away like arrows, you must hold on to that shield because you don't see them coming all the time. They're sneaky. They come out of nowhere. But if you're holding the shield, it won't hurt you if you're holding on to your faith. Praise God for that. Salvation. Amen. Salvation is the helmet. The helmet of salvation refers to the assurance of salvation. Your salvation has been won. You are saved when you believe in Jesus Christ. We have this in Christ and the future hope of final salvation. In other words, when Jesus comes back, the second coming, he's going to save us from this world. Oh, God, please come soon. All the teenagers are mad at me for saying that. They got plans. They got dreams. Yeah. I, I promise you, heaven's going to be so much better. It's going to be so much better. Revelation 12, 11, they triumphed over him the devil, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. You have the blood of Jesus Christ that says you are saved. And then you have your living testimony that you're a changed person from the inside out. New mind, new actions, new attitude and view on life. Praise God for that. You know, the devil will whisper lies that make us question our salvation. He would try to get you, again, to think about whether you're righteous or, righteous or not. He would try to distort the truth. He would do it all. But what's interesting about this is we must put on the other pieces of, of armor, putting on the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the sandals of peace, and holding the shield of faith is extremely important to assist the battlefield of the mind with the helmet. You see, the helmet was the last thing they put on as armor. They got everything on, and they may even take the helmet and kind of hold it and walk out with it. They may put it right on and go to the battle line for, or after that. But it was the last thing. It's like the cap on top of all the armor, all the defensive armor, that is. We cannot go into war with just the message of salvation. We need all the armor on. We need to carry the truth the righteousness, the peace. Because why? It's part of the salvation message. Salvation includes the truth, righteousness, peace, and faith. It's the cap of all of your defensive armor. So put on the helmet of salvation. 
at the end. And so lastly, I think there's two weapons. I'm going to wait for the second weapon next week, and I believe prayer is a weapon. And it's a way, yes. See, the devil has his arrows, but we have prayer. And I prayed for a woman one time on the phone, and she was healed over the phone. Sounds like we have our own weapon to fight against sickness and infirmity or depression, fear. When we pray for people, even on a phone, even through an email, man, that's powerful. But today, what Paul says in verse 17 is to take up the sword. And it says something really interesting, the sword of the spirit. Like the spirit kind of owns the sword in a sense. The, the word of God. In other words, the spirit wields the word of God. That's how important the word of God is. The Holy Spirit is using it. We have evidence for that right here in 1 Peter 1, 20 through 21. The Spirit inspired the apostles and the prophets what to write. 2 Timothy 3, 16, all scriptures God breathed. The, the word there is the Spirit, breath or pneuma, the Spirit. And the Spirit uses the word to guide, teach, convict, sanctify, meaning to purify or set apart, correct, even heal and encourage you. The word of God, can. it's the only double-edged sword that can actually help you if you get hit with it. Isn't that weird? Because it's spiritual. It cuts away the sin. It cuts away the fear. It cuts away the depression. That's a good thing. The cancer of sin in your life, it cuts it away. And it trains us and equips us because it's alive, active, sharper than any double-edged sword. When Satan came to tempt Jesus, he distorted the Bible. But Jesus corrected him with the proper use of scripture. We must wield the scripture properly. That's why at Calvary, we're taking the time to teach you scripture so that you can wield it properly and you can help your kids and your family and friends wield the scripture right too. Thank you for spending multiple months through one book of the Bible. Thank you for wanting to learn the depths of God's word so that your kids will know the difference between the devil's lie and the truth of God. This has been valuable time spent in God's word. Thank you, God, for teaching the word. Thank you, God, for teaching and helping us learn it. But the word of God, the Bible, and the sword of the spirit is defensive and offensive. You can block a blow with the sword. You can cut down a lie that Satan says. But you can also advance the gospel with it. Because here's what it says in Romans 1, 16. We are not ashamed of this good news, the gospel about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes. So I take my word out to the community, to my friends, to people who come into this church wanting to know more about Christ. And I take that word and I unashamedly share the good news of Christ because it has the power to save them. That's the same power you have too with the word of God. So the big question though is, this is all great, but it's spiritual. No one has a, maybe you do, but no one has a chest at the foot of their bed with a bunch of armor in it, physical armor. So how do you put it on? It's a good question. Well, the whole armor of God is a picture of Jesus Christ. Christ is the truth. He is our righteousness, our peace, our object of faith, our salvation, and he is the word of God. So when we believed in Christ, we have already received the armor. We have already been clothed in Christ. Now by faith, we must live in it. And by faith and by prayer, so one theologian believes prayer isn't just a weapon, but it's the way you put it on. And so when you get up in the morning, you're probably not thinking, I'm gonna get attacked. But maybe we should. 
And it's probably not your coffee maker breaking, even though that can feel like an attack. <laughs> it's more than that. The devil doesn't want to just ruin your morning routine. He wants you to be so sidetracked that everything that God wanted to do to you, you can't, or do with you and through you today, that day, you can't hear God because you're so bothered by everything else. But by faith and prayer, we put on the armor and I suggest that we live in it and never take it off. Because the battle is heavy and the devil doesn't quit. Thankfully, God never sleeps or slumbers, so he's always protected us but I'm pretty cool with sleeping in my armor. I think I wanna do that. And sometimes you need to think about it and remember who you are in Christ. The book started of Ephesians, it started with the lesson, you are in Christ when you are saved. Literally in Christ. Here's a great way of looking at it. You are inside the armor of Christ. It's Jesus protecting you. It's Jesus with you. Wow. But we are never out of reach of Satan's schemes. So we must never be without the whole armor of God. Would you agree? Amen. Wow. Powerful word from Paul. Because we have work to do. And the devil doesn't like it. And we're not going to quit. We're gonna keep going under the power and the might of Jesus Christ, not our own power. Keep going. You've been praying for your kids. You've been praying for your neighbors. When you do things for God, you're gonna fight. You're gonna have opposition. You're gonna come against things. Do not let it discourage you. Let it tell you you're doing something right. Amen? Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word today. We needed this today. Lord, we need to live in our armor. Thank you for gracing us with your salvation, faith, righteousness, peace, the sword, faith, everything, God. Thank you for it. We need it all. And Lord, we commit ourselves to not do this life on our own power. When things get hard, when the battle gets heavy, we will be on our knees and we will never let go of that sword. We will hold on to the word of God. And Lord, we will keep it close to our hearts and minds and our eyes. We will read it. We will listen to it. We will live it. Thank you, Lord, that we have overwhelming victory in your son, Jesus. No matter what this world is doing, no matter how far it's getting away from you, no matter how much it hates us as your children, we are victorious. We rest knowing that we are protected by your love and your power. So we walk out of here in the armor of God. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, church, and again, happy Father's Day.